These are the oldest stories. Online at oldeststories.net. We are continuing the Sumerian royal cycle by moving on to the two-part tale of King Lugalbanda, told in Lugalbanda in the Mountain Cave and Lugalbanda and the Anzu Bird. These stories pick up shortly after where our story from last time left off. If you will recall, last time King Enricar of the wealthy and powerful city Uruk had sent a large number of diplomatic entreaties to the lord of a city called Arata, nestled deep in the mountains of modern-day Iran, finally receiving Lord Arata's notice of submission. However, sometime between the end of the last tablet and the start of this one, it seems Lord Arata again went back on his word. King Enricar was finally out of patience, and so the tale of Lugalbanda begins with the declaration of war that we spent last episode waiting for. On the north bank of the Euphrates River sat a wealthy and well-irrigated plain known at the dawn of history as the land of Kulaba. At the beating heart of the land of Kulaba sat the first wonder of the world, 80,000 men and slaves living behind high walls within even higher structures of clean and durable brick. For a few hundred years, there were three square miles on the surface of the earth where nomadic transience and subsistence agriculture had been replaced by technology, prosperity, and civilization. From the formation of the earth in the cold void of space four billion years ago until this time, there had never been a great city like Uruk. But the arrogant fool Lord Arata had raised his mace in rebellion against King Enricar. He thought he was safe behind the high mountains of the Iranian plateau. So the king told the heralds to sound all the trumpets in the kingdom. And all at once, from atop the high walls, the signal rolled out and carried across the entire land of Kulaba. In the city, the men of Uruk were mustered like a great flood, while the surrounding countryside had men mustered like a clouded sky, and the whole army kicked up so much dust as they milled about outside the walls that the gods in heaven began to cough. Now at the head of the army, obviously, was King Enricar. Then beneath him were eight generals. Seven of them were seven brothers, each the children of the goddess Uras, who had been raised in the wilderness by wild cows. Each one of them was a hero amongst men in the absolute prime of life, and we will never hear about them again. But beneath them was the usual set of military officers. All together, each general commanded 25,200 soldiers for a grand total of 202,000 men under arms. Now let's not skip over the part where this number is completely made up. Previously, I did mention the city of Uruk had 80,000 men. That is from archaeological evidence, which suggests a population at peak for Uruk of between 50,000 and 80,000. I do like the larger number personally. And so 202,000 men under arms is uh, completely absurd. But putting that aside, the eighth general, was a youth named Lugalbanda. He was an odd mix of things because originally he had been a shepherd before being called to military service, but at the same time, he was descended by a different line from the other seven generals, but from the same sun god, Shamash, who was the ancestor of Enmakar as well. His very name means young and fierce king, so clearly his mother had had some sort of premonition when he was born. Now in this grand parade, it is said that when he was presented to the troops, he ritually washed and then walked down the ranks and the entire army fell silent at the sight of him. Now clearly, part of the story of Lugal Banda is simply lost to time. And honestly, it makes my heart ache that we won't know why he was held in such high regard, even at the very beginning of the story. In any case, the army set out east towards the rebellious Arata. 
On the sixth day, they stopped and took a bath. Then on the seventh day, they entered the mountains. And now this is actually a fairly reasonable timeline, assuming they marched 20 to 30 miles a day to reach the western edge of the Persian mountains. But then, halfway through the high and difficult mountains of the Iranian plateau, Lugal Banda caught what the text calls head sickness. He jerked like a snake dragged by its head with a reed. His mouth bit the dust like a gazelle caught in a snare. No longer could his hands return the hand grip. No longer could he lift his feet high. No one in the army could cure him. And in the vast inhospitable mountains, they simply couldn't afford the rations to stand around being indecisive about it. They did consider sending him back home, but sending only a small contingent to carry him back would have been dangerous in general, and honestly, probably too taxing for a deeply sick man. And so they found a mountain cave and lit a fire to keep him warm and wrapped him up in linens. They put in the cave a whole storehouse of foods and multiple kinds of beverages, and they wrapped him with his axe and his dagger, all in all, an effect that looked like he was being wrapped for a funeral, even going so far as to light incense. His friends, the other generals, felt a little guilty about this, but they justified it to themselves. They said, if, like the sun in the morning, he is resurrected from this illness, then he'll have enough food and supplies to make it back to Urk. But if he gets called to the afterlife, I mean, these things happen then at least he has enough provisions here for that journey as well. And we'll make sure to bring his body back when we pass by here again. And as the men, as close to him as brothers, walked out of the cave, Lugal Banda stared at them, his eyes overflowing like irrigation ditches, but his lips stayed closed. His friends made a great show of weeping and mourning as they left him, but they left him just the same. For two and a half days, Lugal Banda suffered alone in the cave, shivering and sweating in turn, until finally in pain he lifted his eyes towards the sun, his father Shamash in heaven, and he cried out to him, Please, please, please let me be ill no longer. Here I am, all alone, no family, no friends, not even an acquaintance over here. Anyone who saw me here would say that it, it's not right for me to die here. They would say, a lost dog is bad, but a lost man, that's terrible. I am here in some unknown cave, in some unknown mountain, and I'm going to die in an obscure hole like some weakling. And Shamash, who's the god of the sun, but also of justice, sent him down some encouragement. Now, Lugal Banda couldn't do much with encouragement, though, because it didn't really make him less sick. He uh, couldn't hold it in his hands. He just sort of moved on, because he knew better than to curse the gods, but switching gods, now, that was an option. He said, Ishtar, lady of mercy and love, Bring me comfort like you bring food to a poor man. Bring me comfort like your prostitutes bring delight to the inn. And yes, it really does say that in the original text. I cannot die in battle, it seems, but I can't even die in the comfort of Uruk. And blessed Ishtar gave him the comfort of sleep. And in his dreams, she came to him to give him comfort for the whole night. But in the morning, she returned to Uruk, and Lugal Banda returned to his suffering. And so next, he went up the chain. He tried the god Suen. Now, this is not a deity we have encountered so far in this mythic cycle. He's had many forms over the centuries, and some claim he's even the moon god of Arabia, whose worship was so pervasive that all the modern Muslim countries still have moons on their flags. The star, of course, being representative of the Arab version of Ishtar. Now, is this a true fact or an internet fact? The world may never know. 
But what Luke Banda knew was that he was supplicating his direct grandfather, God of wisdom and the moon, father of the sun. And so he cried out, not for pity, but for cosmic righteousness. Swin, he said, you are the king so high that none can reach you. You are the king who loves justice and hates evil, smiting all the evil in your path. I know that you become so angry when you see evil that you just spit venom like a snake. So the god of the moon heard this supplication and smote the sickness from Lugalbanda's body. Because suffering and discomfort are one thing. That's fine, we've got plenty of that in ancient Mesopotamia. But violations of the cosmic order, those are unacceptable to the Sumerian gods. And so Lugalbanda, now cured, stood up. And after another sunrise, he left the cave, strong and healthy as a bull and glowing with the radiance of the sun. He then gave praise to all the gods, even the ones that didn't really help him out much here. Then he picked up as much as he carry and went out into the night. Now there was no one in this miserable mountain wasteland. And even the goats that he hunted were scrawny and gross. He was forced to scavenge weird, scraggly plants off the mountainside, and he manages to catch a single wild bull, which is, by the standards of the time, pretty desolate. After eating some of the plants, he fell asleep even before he had time to kill the animals, and dreams the first drug-induced dream ever recorded in written record. It went like this. To the liar it talks in lies, to the truthful it speaks truth. It can make one man happy, it can make another man sing, just like the power of love. But it is the closed tablet basket of the gods. It is the beautiful bedchamber of Ninlil. It is the counselor of Ishtar, the multiplier of mankind, the voice of one not alive. Zangara, the god of dreams, himself like a bull, bellowed at Lugal Banda in the form of half a cow. The god said, somebody better be sacrificing a wild bull and two goats to me. And not just that, this somebody had better wrestle the bull down unarmed while killing the goats with somebody's axe and dagger. And then put it all together in a blood pit and cover it with barley corn so that it smells so good that all the snakes in the mountain can smell it. Then Lugalbanda woke up. He said to himself, wow, how did the voice in my dreams just happen to know that I had captured a bull and two goats yesterday and that I happened to have axe, dagger, and barley corns? Surely, surely, said Lugalbanda, this is far too much to be simple coincidence. And so he performed the sacrifice precisely as he saw it in the dream. And upon lighting the fire, demons of all the gods rose from the fire, creeping and crawling out of the dark shadows to consume the sacrifice. But that's cool, because you don't mess around with gods who have aspects as fire demons. You just say, okay, and you move on. And so Lugalbanda moved on, wandering in the miserable loneliness of this mountainous wasteland, until one day he reaches the Lullaby Mountains. Apparently they are pronounced like that in original Sumerian. And he meets an adorable little Anzu bird. Now a grown Anzu bird is a terrifying predator that eats fully grown bulls, but also like dragons are known to be wise. And so partly from loneliness and partly as a cunning plan to gain favor, he takes some sweet food from his pack and he makes a little cake to feed the hungry bird. And then he says, you know, you know, how about I keep going with this? I think, I think I can make something work out here. And so he gives the bird just a little more honey. Then he feeds it some sheep fat. Then he feeds it some goat fat. Then he starts tossing it little cakes. Then he really starts pampering the bird, dabbing around its eyes with some nice makeup and puffing white cedar perfume around its head. And, 
And you might ask, why, why did he have these things in the empty mountain wilderness? But remember, he'd just been arranged as a corpse with lavish funeral offerings set before him. So it isn't quite as crazy as it might seem. But just for completeness sake, he also hung a few sticks of salt meat around the nest in easy reach of the now very content baby bird, then hid behind a tree to wait. After a bit, Papa Bird and Mama Bird start flying back to the nest with a big haul from the day's hunt. Live bulls, dead bulls, just a whole lot of bull up in this. The Anzu bird calls out to its baby bird that dinner's on its way, baby, but now usually baby bird starts chipping and chirping away. Oh yeah, I'm so excited, it's dinner time I'm coming, but the baby bird is silent. And Papa Bird calls again, but the baby still, he's just, he's just, you know, not making any noise. And then Papa Bird completely freaks out with a massive screech that sends even the minor gods of the mountain scurrying into crevices like ants. Where is my baby? When Papa Bird and Mama Bird sprint back to their nest, they see Baby Bird gurgling happily with cute little makeup on its face and perfume in its feathers, and little meat sticks all around the nest. And as the Anzu bird is breathing a huge sigh of relief, Lugal Banda steps from behind the tree and begins right away with the flattery on the Anzu bird. And right away he's really laying it on thick. He says, oh bird with sparkling eyes, your grandfather placed heaven in your hand and your spine is as straight as a scribe's. Your breast as you fly is like Naira parting the waters and your back is like a verdant palm garden, which was apparently all high praise 5,000 years ago. Because the Anzu bird, he starts to laugh from a mixture of relief that his baby is safe and from all of a sudden unexpected flattery he says, ah, <laughs> you, you are good. You are good. I like you. Now, how about this? How about this? How about I send you back to Uruk with a cart overflowing with gold and gems so that you can go back home. Get out of this wilderness. Go back to civilization with your head held high. Lugal Banda shakes his head sadly at the bird and he says, you know, I appreciate, I appreciate the offer, but I really don't need any of that. Nonsense, nonsense, replies the Anzu bird. I just can't let you leave without some kind of reward. Look, you've been, you've done a good thing right here. How about I give your bow the power to shoot moonlight and sunbeams that will strike your targets like a viper? Again, Lugal Banda said, oh, well, I don't really need any of that either. Well, says the Anzu bird, I can give you the impenetrable breastplate that will never permit retreat. You will always be armored like a rock in battle, but this too, Lugal Banda rejected. Ah, said the Anzu bird, I know what you really need. I have Demuzi's butter churn, and I can give you a lifetime supply of butter. Mughal Banda blinked and paused and said, um, that's okay, I really don't need that either. And the Anzu bird looked at Lugal Banda, and Lugal Banda looked at the bird. And the bird said, look, what game is this? What are you doing? You tell me what you want, or you go away. Holy Lugal Banda, son of gods, replies Anzu Bird, put the power of running in my legs and strength in my arms. Let me reach any place my heart desires. Let me never become weak. I would move with the power of sunlight, the grace of Ishtar, and the fury of seven storms. Let me leap like a flame and blaze like lightning. Do this, and I will have every wood carver in the city of Uruk fashion a statue of you, and your name will be famous in all of Sumer, and the artistry will do credit to the gods. And the bird said, sure, and it was done. Then the Anzu bird told Lugalbanda where he had last seen the Sumerian army, giving him directions, but 
Real quick, he said, listen, don't tell anybody that you've been granted great strength and a heroic fate because they're likely to get suspicious. Just be cool about all this. Lugal Banda nodded, and in a single leap, suddenly in the midst of the siege camp outside the walls of Arata. Now the soldiers of Uruk were all astonished. They had thought he was certain to die out there, and he asked, they asked him, how did you survive? And he sort of circumspectly, he said, well, I just lived off the land. You know, I sort of became one with the animals, and I just survived through sheer tenacity. And apparently, this is again where we're missing these stories, he had enough reputation that people just nodded. They said, oh yeah, Lugal Bandy, he, he can do that sort of thing. And then they, then they welcomed him in and there was much rejoicing at his return. And then for a year, the soldiers of Uruk laid siege to the city of Arata, all day and all night throwing stones and arrows and javelins over the walls because this wasn't a siege like we think of nowadays or even like we think of in the classical or middle ages. They really didn't have a lot of the wall breaking technology that we take for granted in later days. All they could really do was just toss stuff over the walls and the people of Arata would just tell their children, hey, don't, don't play around the walls or some stray rock might fall on your head. And uh, so obviously, it wasn't much going on with this siege, and the, but the men, they all sort of became uneasy with the lack of progress with this siege. King Enmakar announced to the camp that they were going to seek Goddess Ishtar's advice on this matter, and everybody just started nodding their head in agreement. Then King Enmakar said, now all I need are a few soldiers to travel back to Uruk for just a little bit, and suddenly the soldiers looked to each other. How... How exactly did we get here? I mean, that was a year ago. Everybody in the camp seemed either too lazy to walk back or simply lost. And I presume the messenger from last episode was just sick to death of making that journey. And so little Banda stood up and he said, I will go, but only if you give me the divine royal emblems of Uruk as proof that I am coming from you and you let me travel all alone. And somehow, no one thought that this was terribly sketchy. But with the royal seal and a message for Ishtar, Lugal Banda walked real slowly away from the camp until the moment he turned the corner around a mountain and bam, shot out to Uruk. Arriving there around midnight, slightly before Ishtar took her dinner, apparently she liked to eat late, I guess. This can't question the gods, you know. Then after presenting the royal seals, Ishtar asked how it was that he had made it all the way back on his own, but rather than answering, he said, look, I have a message for you from King Enmakar. He asks, why you blessed him with prosperity for the last 50 years, but now in this particular campaign have deserted him? We all wish to either see victory or return home. Being stuck in this endless siege is just absolutely miserable for everybody involved. And Lady Ishtar replied with a parable, instructing in Makar to travel to a certain clear river near the city of Arata, and cut down a lone tamarisk tree, and with it weave a basket that he will then use to catch a fish with his own hands from the river, then cook it and eat it. Ugubanda nods as she speaks. He is fully comfortable with cryptic, mystical solutions when dealing with the gods. But of course, I'm sitting here. What, what's going on here? I looked all over the internet. What's go is this like a magic spell? Is, is this a parable? What's going on? But finally, in the last line, she reveals the true meaning of her parable. Then he will have brought to an end that which in the subterranean waters provides the life strength of Arata. You see, it turns out the reason the city of Arata was so confident in its ability to withstand the siege pretty much indefinitely was because an underground stream transported fish and water into the city. But the tamarisk tree is famous for absorbing salt from the ground, and so 
Ishtar's plan boils down to catch all the fish and salt the river. And indeed, in short order after Lugalbanda returns, the city of Arata's strength fails and their walls are repainted with the green and red of Uruk. Thus ending the tale of Lugalbanda and the four tablet royal cycle of the war between Arata and Uruk. Now there's a lot going on with this story and the hardest part of all of it is that very clearly Lugalbanda was a character with many, many epic adventures that have simply been lost to us. Superhero archetypes like we have nowadays with Marvel and DC are really as old as humanity itself. Now we'll see this again with Gilgamesh, but we see it here too with Lugal Banda. Here's a man known to be able to survive in any wilderness even before his story starts. And then he receives the additional superpower of super speed and greater strength. There is no reason to think for a moment that the 2,500 years in which Mesopotamian gods and kings were an active cultural force, a period that only ended with the final death of cuneiform script around 400 AD, saw Lugal Banda going on any fewer adventures than Batman, Superman, or any other modern iteration of the superheroic character. But, just to fill in a few gaps, Enmerkar reigns for another 400 to 900 years after the conclusion of this tale, according to the official Sumerian kings list. And when he finally dies, it is Lugal Banda, now famed as the Wandering King, who is selected to take over. Was he called the Wandering King before he was king? I don't know. His name has king in it, so maybe, but it's very, very unsure. He then rules for 1,200 years, explores every part of heaven and earth, and has all manner of adventures that have been entirely lost to time. It almost makes me motivated to write Lugal Banda fan fiction. Sitting alone would make it a compelling, unique comic book. Sadly, I barely have the talent to podcast. Anything else is probably beyond me. In these two tales, though, I want you to notice the direct power of gods in this world. Honestly, I've stripped out a lot of it because there are long segments of just meaningless pieties that don't really advance the story. But even in this stripped down retelling, we can see that they aren't just sitting up in heaven somewhere. The gods truly are active forces that the people of Sumeria believed they contended with on a daily basis. It is an important context because if we take the gods to just be metaphors, as is so often the case with modern reinterpretations of ancient myth, then we're going to miss a lot out of the tale of Gilgamesh. That is, because we're going to speed past Lulubanda's reign, skip entirely the brief interregnum of Dumazid the herder, and I hope you join me next episode as we begin part one of the most famous, most ancient tale, the epic of Gilgamesh. Thank you for listening.